in this episode. The word prospect has been watered down quite a bit over the years. Right. <laughs> and a lot of people think, oh, he's a prospect. And they just like throw out that word as mm-hmm. it's just it's just a word. What qualifies a prospect for a professional level? I mean, for us, again, it, we're, we're looking for guys that, are, that have a chance of playing Major League Baseball. So, the, and, so when you see a guy, are you like, okay, can I see him in a big league stadium? What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of The Closing Pitch. My name is Spiker Helms, and this is a show about people, culture, and how to create a winning lifestyle. We've had some really good responses in the last two episodes. Um, First one was about Twitter plus recruiting. Um, We talked about how to think differently. In um, the last episode, we talked about how thinking about the deck is stacked against you, how that's not a good um, thought process. We're all guilty of it. Um, And complaining can end up stockpiling itself and causing an avalanche. And next thing you know, you're in the spiral of death. So listen to those two episodes. We've had a lot of good feedback on that. Also, make sure that you give us a subscribe and then um, give us a five-star rating that helps us out in reaching more people. In this episode, though, this is going to be totally about baseball. I'm intrigued by this because scouting has been one of those things for me where it's a little bit obscure. It feels a little opaque. I don't know what the culture's like. And it took me a while until I got out of baseball to really understand how scouting is done. And then what's the difference between college scouting and professional scouting. And then we talk talk about international and then you talk about actually scouting minor leaguers. It's a totally different huge different um, hierarchy and it feels like it's more underground than anything else and so what we have is we have a special guest mark adair you're originally from st louis and you went to mizzou and you pointed out that i had strategically pushed the table into two different sections we have the missouri state guys versus the mizzou guys so we have aaron jaworski um on my left far left and then right next to me is evan pratt we both went to missouri state so this is a little bit of a strategic setup for the conversation so before we start mark i want to give i want you to do a background on yourself um guys he has been with the chicago he was with the chicago cubs for 20 years he's with the houston astros for one year and then now he's with the oakland athletic he has been an area scout. He's also been a regional supervisor. And now you're a national cross checker. Is there anything that I'm missing inside of that background from a professional I've, standpoint? Yeah, I've uh, pretty much covered it all. Um, like you said, it started at Missouri. Well, initially it started at in North County, one of McClure High School. Then ended up going to Missouri, walked on there, um, got the opportunity to play, ended up getting a little bit of money towards the end of the career there. So it worked out. One of the better moves I've ever made playing there. It kind of helped me, guide me towards where I am now, the people I met, um, the, the resources I had in order to get into what I'm doing now. Um, yeah, I've Cubs for 20 years. Um, you know, it's hard to be a Cub guy being from St. Louis, but I found a way to get through it. Uh, it was a long 20 years. I mean, as it's well documented, our up and down of our, you know, record and seasons and Lucky enough, my last year there was the year we won the World Series. <clears throat> we had some new guys come in the front office, made some changes. Uh, they got me a chance to get back home to St. Louis. Ended up with Houston. Lucky enough, fell into another World Series in 2017. <laughs> um, so that path was pretty good for me. And then Oakland opened up a position for me there in order for me to stay home and to get deeper into scouting on the amateur side. So I chose that, and that's kind of where I am now. Explain what a national cross checker is. We're going to go down that hierarchy, right. but um, mm-hmm. kind of give a background on like what a national cross checker is, because I don't think a lot of people know what that means. Um, well, the way it's it's set up, and a lot of teams pretty much have it set up the same way, uh, with just some different different ways in which they do it. Um, for us, a national cross checker is there's four of us in the system. We pretty much oversee different regions of the country. So myself, I oversee four area scouts. So each one of our national guys pretty much oversees four area scouts. Um, we're kind of the, 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 the go-between from the area scout to the scouting director to the front office. So the area scout pretty much is the guy that identifies a player early. Depending on how good that player is, 
you'll start having regional cross checkers, national cross checkers come in, and it's, it's never really a thumbs down, but it's more so a thumbs up just to kind of get the player continue to get pushed up the board. Um, so it's 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 just a spot where we're just uh, basically the voice between the area scout and the front office when it comes time for the draft. So what's the difference between a regional and a national guy? Is it, there's no difference? It's, for us, it's – they gave us titles as national guys, but in essence, we're regional during the spring, so we mm-hmm. cover a certain area, a certain region. Gotcha. Once the draft is over for us, all four of us go out and, and pretty much crisscross the country nationally with all the summer showcases, the college showcases, college events. So it's kind of a hybrid system for us because we're regional during the draft because we're responsible for a certain area, mm-hmm. and then we become more national guys once the summer hits. And then where does Bird Dog Scouts rank inside those? Uh, yeah, Bird Dog Scout's probably the at the bottom of the area scout. It's more so a, a local guy that lives, let's say, in the St. Louis area. He's a guy that's going to kind of go, go around and watch games and make a phone call. Hey, I see a guy I think might be a guy. You might want to check him out if you get a chance to. So most Bird Dogs don't have any real allegiance to an organization. They're pretty much just kind of just helping out, just kind of beating the bushes a little bit in some of the smaller areas. So they're more of like they're kind of breaking the story a little bit. And then the area scout kind of investigates to see if that's right, really right. the thing. In the way it's been lately with scouting and so many resources and so many events, for the most part, we find players at a lot of the college college so, summer showcases, um, whether it's area code games, East Coast Pro, all the PG events. Mm-hmm. Most of those events are going during the summer is kind of where we find those players. So the role of a bird dog is probably not as much as it probably used to used to be. So we just have so many different avenues and ways and finding places. Well, the internet kind of exploded on that. Internet, because you have kids that are posting video like all the time. And again, for us, it, it kind of helps. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can sift through the ones that you know you probably shouldn't spend too much time on, but there are some video that you can get on a player that kind of helps you know start the start the path down the road to you know possibly being drafted. So then, the scouting director is technically the CEO or the higher up for all of the scouts and manages the whole process. He manages everything within the scouting department. He manages the budget. He manages our travel. Uh, obviously, he manages our players. But also, scouting directors also go out and see players and write reports the same way we all do. Oh, okay. Um, but they're more geared towards going operations. To watch operations, but still, they're more geared towards watching whoever's going to be our like first, second round type picks. Okay. Those guys, he's probably going to go out and see. But also, he still has to manage the staff. And then he reports to the GM? The GM. The GM. And then the GM sees both the actual club and the scout. And the right. Our, our GM does a pretty good job with us in terms of he's – we have a really good relationship with him. Mm-hmm. Um, he came out this summer, which most GMs don't do, but he did come out this summer and saw some amateur players with us. Because he, he, he has some say-so in who we take as well, especially in the first round. When you're talking about that kind of money – the GM has to sign off on, on that type of guy. So we're lucky where our GM does spend a lot of time out in the field with us. And you split up the United States into four different regions? Four and different then, regions. Okay, and then what, what region do you cover? Basically, it's the upper Midwest towards the East Coast. So I go as far as, let's say, Kansas, all the way over to Pennsylvania. Canada, I have some of Canada. Um, as far as South, Arkansas, Ohio, Kentucky, over that way. How do you keep track of all of the information? That's a huge region to cover <laughs> just for like one person. And also you're dealing with area scouts right, as well. Right. How do you manage all of that information? Because there are so many players out there. Well, I mean, it's when you start talking about guys that you want to draft and bring into your organization, there's probably not as many as you think. Okay. Uh, there are a lot of players out there that just aren't prospects. Um, guys can kind of weed themselves out as well. Um, but, I mean, our system, again, is the same as everybody else's system. Um, all our information goes into, we call it OASIS, our computer system. So all the information goes into that. So we know which guys to target, which guys we need to spend time on. It's kind of the old phrase where it's follow the money. The guys you know they are going to acquire a lot of money, the value is really high, you're going to spend more time with those players than you are some of the other players. And the board prospect has been watered down quite a bit over the years. Right. <laughs> and – a lot of people think, oh, he's a prospect. And they just like throw out that word as it's just, it's just a word. What qualifies a prospect for a professional level? That's, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's pretty loaded. It depends on who that term is coming from. Um, 
I mean, for us, again, it, we're, we're looking for guys that, are, that have a chance of playing Major League Baseball. So, the, and, so when you see a guy, are you like, okay, can I see him in a big league stadium? That's, that's, that's part of the process. And most, for the most part, when I see a guy, we've already determined that guy's probably a prospect. You know, you have certain guys that kind of weed themselves out, like I said, in some of the summer events, the high school events. Mm-hmm. But most of the high school events that we do, those guys are already they, – they're already on the map. How, mm-hmm. how did they get on your map, like th- those kids that you haven't seen yet but you're going to watch them? Like do you hear it from your scouts below you? Most, or like I say, most of the time we, we hear it from the scouts below the area scouts. Um, again, those events that we cover in the summer, we spend a lot of time on those summer events. And those players are either recommended by scouts – those players are players that we've been seeing the previous year. We, we watched a prospect, but there was a junior or sophomore on his team that might have been pretty good, so we'll take that name down, continue to follow that guy. Same thing with the college guys. We watch college teams. We're watching the whole team. So by the time that guy is a freshman, by the time he gets to be you know, a junior or being draft eligible, we already knew about him. So a lot of the high school guys come from, you know, again, it's, it's recommended by scouts, recommended by guys that go play in Jupiter, some of these teams that – Playing Jupiter, we go cover Jupiter, and we watch watch all those games. So, is that the easiest way at those big events? Because most of the kids are at one place. Is that the easiest oh, yeah, for you guys? I mean, that's like one stop shopping. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, we we'll flood those events with probably twelve or thirteen scouts just on our staff. So you think thirteen scouts times you know thirty teams? That's that's where we go find the players. How how long are you spending at these games? Are you spending the whole game watching these guys, or is it just literally okay? I want to see a few actions and then as I'm far good. As the summer events, well, <clears throat> yeah, just in, well, I, I guess it's more of a general question and generalities. Well, yeah, if, if yeah, for the most part, if I go to a game, I'm going to be there for the entire game. I mean, especially again, I'm going to see a guy who we already determined as a prospect. So okay. I'm going to be there from the beginning of the game to the end of the so game. So then, like, what about the area guys? Are they staying there for the whole They're game? Staying there for the whole game as well. And again, the only difference is. I mean, we value a lot of what our area scouts do. Mm-hmm. I mean, you got some really, really good scouts at the area scout level. Um, so, you know, that we'll spend just as much time at the games as, as they will. Very seldom you get guys to kind of hop around, you know, three innings here, three. You, you can't do that because you never know what you're going to miss, you know, at the latter part of the game, how a guy's going to react towards the end of the game or whatever. What, what makes a good scout? Uh, <laughs> that's, that's, that, that can be, that can be a tough one. Uh, for me. Is it just um, organizing information? I, I think, I is think it your organizing eyes? Inf- organizing information is huge. There's so much information out there. You have to find a way to organize it and you have to be on top of your area. Um, the evaluation part probably comes last. Interesting. I mean, the, yeah, guys see things differently and guys, it takes time for a guy to really be able to tell what's a prospect, who's the next guy, so to speak, or what guy just doesn't have it. Uh, so the evaluation piece just comes over time and comes with experience. But the first, second year area scout, if that guy's organized, if he's knows how to build relationships, knows how to make contacts, that's like the, the most important part of the job as far as our organization is concerned. We have to do the work. Going to see the players is the easy part. So you almost have to be the ultimate networker. Oh, you have to be. Yeah, definitely. You mm-hmm. got to – as an area scout, you got to be in contact with the player, the family, the agent, the coach. Do you so, lean on the college coaches a lot? It depends on are the they? college coach. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and nowadays, college coaches are geared to win. Uh-huh. So, and again, by no fault of theirs, I mean, that's their job, but they may not give us true information on certain players because they may want that player to come back for another year. Gotcha. So you kind of got to sift through that. But, again, that goes back to if you build a good enough relationship with that coach – and he's honest with you, then that's where you you know help build that connection, and it works for the organization. But where, it, it goes back and forth, though. Where do where do most scouts find their leads on on guys, or where do where do they start with? Like if I was if I was a new scout, and I was like, all right, I'm you just hired me as a <coughs> starting area scout. Right. What would be what would be your first advice for, to me to go? Okay, this these are the things that you need to hit up right away. They're gonna know again. We do an awful lot of work during the summer, and I don't think people realize how much. But when we hit these summer events, the Area Code, Ecos Pro, PG events, we're not just there just to watch. We're there. We're writing reports during those. So we get a follow list of players that we're going to go follow for the next spring. So if we get a new scout to come in, he's going to get that follow list. So he's going to know where to start because we already have a list for him of players that we've already seen during the summer or have seen in the past. But for the most part, 
especially college wise, you're gonna go where where the players are. You're gonna go where the programs that turn out players. Mm-hmm. You're gonna go see those guys during the fall. And this is a weird weird question, but I know that athletes are thinking about this because mm-hmm. college scouts love billboarding and putting out like I'm this is I'm wearing my program's school colors. Do pro scouts do that, or do they go under the radar? Some some guys do, but again, it's it's it again it's a thing where I mean it's most of the stuff you get is free. Um, so you're probably going to wear some of it. Um, yeah, it's, it, but it's not, it's not, you're not trying to do it to build, to create exposure for yourself. Yeah. Um, some guys wear their stuff all the time. Some guys never wear it. So, again, for the most part, the players that we're going to see are pretty much already prospects. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're not trying to be, you know, incognito or trying to hide in the bushes or anything like that. So. And what what events for from an amateur status that you have to hit hit up every year? Um, we hit the um, PDP event early, and that's the initial start of choosing the eighteen U Team USA. So we hit that the first part of the summer. We hit uh, area code games. That's four or five days with all the best players in the country. We hit uh, East Coast Pro Showcase down in Alabama. Again, these events have. I mean, 13 to 15 scouts per team at these events. Um, you have some guys that will hit certain PG events, especially down in Lake Point. Mm-hmm. You get a lot of teams down there, a lot of players down there. So some of these guys that are traveling throughout the summer, they'll play with some of those teams that are traveling. So those three to begin with, and then Jupiter in the fall. And then what are you guys doing in the spring? In the spring, we'll – once the spring starts again, we already know which guys we're going to go spend time on. Like for me, myself – my first event this spring will be just to follow what the best college players are playing. So, so you're spending more time in the college game? Early because those are the ones that are playing. The college, high school guys aren't going to probably play and get going until mm-hmm. middle March, middle, I mean beginning of April. But initially, we, we, we pretty much fish in the college ranks early because that's kind of where our draft mostly comes from. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't shy away from the high school guy, but it has to be a specific high school guy. But for the most part, it's you know who the college guys are. You hit those better college programs. Because the same college programs turn out players every year. You make sure you see those teams, regardless. Um, lucky enough for us, there have been a lot of industries that have been putting out college events where they have some of the better players all in one spot. So kind of like a combine? It's like a combine. It's like a classic or a tournament. But they'll, they, they know players are going to bring scouts. Players are going to bring fans. So. When it's one in Minute Maid. Um, the first one this year is at Globe Life down in Dallas. Um, there's one in Round Rock down in Texas. Um, Minnesota has one up in the Dome. So those first three weekends, those like probably my first three weekends of those three weekends because there are going to be a number of teams at those locations plus with a number of players at those locations. So like the NFL holds like workouts for players. Do major league organizations do that as well? We do. MLB does have a combine at the end of the year, but they're invited players only. Um, and the players will, will work out. They'll take BP. They'll do infield work. Um, the biggest part of that, because most of those players are players we've seen a lot during the spring, the biggest thing for us at the combine is we get a chance to meet with the players. Mm-hmm. So each team has their suite at the stadium where we're going to have it. This past year we had in San Diego at Petco Park. Each team has their suite at the stadium. And the players pretty much like speed dating. They take their turn. <laughs> At, at East Bay, come in 20 minutes, you meet with them, talk to them, and they move to a new spot. But for us, that's probably maybe the only chance we get to meet the player and talk to the player because some colleges have restrictions where they don't want you talking to their players during the season. Mm-hmm. But once that combine comes, we have those meetings set up, we get a chance to know the player a little bit better. Is that a big part of your decision on a draft? Huge. Huge. As far Huge. as obviously the personality, same way with the colleges and the high school guys. Right. You know, we teach our kids, the recruits, to be you know good dudes and – Good students, good citizens, and that's who colleges want. It's the same way on the pro side, I'm assuming, it's, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, that, and that's that's probably one of the bigger jobs for the area scout. I mean, he probably can get a chance to get inside that college program a lot sooner than I can because he's built a connection with the coach. Uh, but when we get down towards the end, those guys are coming to combine. These guys are, you know, first, second, third round type guys. So you want to – your scouting director, your GM, which ours is on Zoom sometimes we have our meetings, but you want to get a chance to know that guy – ask them certain questions, 
And that's a half a million dollar decision. Exactly. Exactly. And when that guy <laughs> leaves, and you're thinking everybody's like shaking hands. Man, we like him. Or they're thinking, wow, what's going on with that kid? So it's you can tell a lot by just meeting with a kid for twenty minutes to a half an hour. But that's that's like a huge part of of what we do in terms of bringing players into your organization. Um, talk about the iterations of the draft because I, I don't I don't think a lot of people realize that the draft has changed quite a bit since. Would it be safe to say since the '90s, it's changed quite a bit overall, from a round perspective, from a timing perspective. Could you like talk about that a little bit? The draft itself uh, has changed obviously because you know, went from 40 rounds to COVID year we had five rounds to where it's 20 now. The thing that doesn't change is the evaluation piece of it. We're still going out and evaluating the player. We're still gauging you know, tools on the field. We're still gauging work ethics. So that stuff hadn't changed. I mean, I'm in my 26th year. That stuff is, is going to remain the same because mm-hmm. the game in the big leagues hadn't changed much in terms of guys you want in your organization. Um, the change in the, in the draft and lesser rounds, mm-hmm. you got to be a little bit more correct because you're drafting fewer players. So you want to have more players come to your organization that are, you have a chance of being helpful. Um, but you don't have a draft and follow anymore. They brought that back. This oh, they did bring year. that back. They okay. brought it back this past year. Um, explain the draft. Again, still explain again the draft. That. Explain well, the draft and follow. It's if it's more so for a high school guy. So if you take a high school guy, and you may feel like he's not quite ready, but you see some ceiling, you see some upside, and probably think he's not quite ready to be in that that pro environment, he'll go to junior college for the most part. He'll go to junior college and. So there's a draft part. We take him, we draft him, then we follow him while he's at a junior college. But during the time he's at that junior college, he's pretty much under our control. So once the draft comes around, we can either negotiate a contract with him. If not, he goes back into the draft. But we're the only one that can negotiate a contract with him before the draft. So it's the so each party benefits from it technically. Because uh, yeah, yeah, because we don't yeah when we draft him, we're not giving up anything. The kid's not locked into anything, um, and it gives us a chance to kind of watch him in a different environment. Yeah. It gives the kid a peace players. of mind that, hey, I still have something on the table. Exactly. How many of those exactly. can you take? Is there a limit per team or is it rounds, or how does that work? You know, in the past, I think more teams used to take more of those players because you have more rounds. Um, now, with there only being 20 rounds, you try to try not to do that too much. Just because you bring a player like that into the organization, you still feel like he's a ways away. I mean, being able to compete at that level. And with a lower number of rounds and the contraction of minor league teams, you got to have players that are pretty much ready to step in and play. And the, the high ceiling guy's going to probably need more at bats. Um, so, yeah, that guy, we're probably going to, you know, we're probably not going to roll the dice too much on, on that guy. Do you lean more on free agents to fill those holes when you need spots in your minor leagues? Or how how does that work? I, I don't go draft. I, I don't get drafted in those twenty rounds, but I'm a good player. So now, does the area guy, regional guy, still have to go out and like fill those roster spots yeah. for you guys? <clears throat> after um, so, so after the so draft, there's hope after the draft for right. So after the, the draft, guys. there's there's non drafted free agents. So we'll reach out after the draft and we'll talk to the area scouts like, hey, we need this, that, or the other. If you got a guy in your area that wasn't drafted, but you like the makeup, you like what the guy brings to the table, and you think he's worth bringing to the table, yeah, we'll. We'll bring that type of guy in and just make a phone call. Hey, you know, draft is passed. Are you still interested in playing? For the most part, those guys want to get a chance. They want to play. And with COVID and the fifth years, there you have 23, 24-year-olds out there that are still trying to play this game. How does that play a factor to all of the players that are in this pool that are trying to make it to professional baseball? You have so many different types and like the maturity level of a twenty three year old, but that's still that's a little late in the game. But it's, yeah, it's 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 late. Um but you know, I guess because of COVID, the older player is pretty much something that's been, you know, evident across the board in all sports. I mean, you get college football players that are twenty five, twenty six years old right now playing college football. <laughs> You know, some of these older basketball teams. I mean, look at Missouri. They got a bunch of old basketball guys right now, but they know how to play, and they obviously help those teams win. Baseball, 
Yeah, maybe a, a little bit different because once you get clock starts, you start getting that 23, 24 range. It's kind of time to either, you know, use your degree or for us to help you make the decision. Because um, we obviously want younger guys mm-hmm. to help build and help, you know, develop. And that's going to take some time. So, so like, what's the – for – the ideal spot, like what age group are you looking at? That's like, yeah, that's, this is the prime age group for being drafted. I mean, 18 to 21. No, oh, that that's, yeah. that's the prime yeah, spot. And once you get past 21, it kind of starts 21. If you're still in college or you're in a ball at 22, things need to start happening quickly for you. Cause if not, we still have younger guys, younger guys coming. Unless you're Tim Tebow. <laughs> unless, unless you're Tim Jones, or, or, or Michael Jordan or guys like if that. If someone that uh, famous. Right, 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 right. A celebrity. So, I mean, and, that, and that's the thing. When, you know, with, there's a draft every year. And I, we'll tell players, I'll tell players I get closer, I'll tell them, hey, I'm out looking for the guy to replace you. We just drafted you last year. I'm looking out for the next guy to push you along. And either you're going to get better or we're going to move on without you. Where does independent baseball rank in all of this? That's a tough one because those guys are, for the most part, the older guys. I mean, you may find an outlier in an independent ball, maybe a pitcher that all of a sudden has, you know, some velocity, always found a way to throw strikes. Or um, I don't think we beat the bushes in the independent leagues much. I mean, because, again, most of those guys have had opportunities. They've played at the college level. Um, and we'll use that history to see what type of player they are. So just because you go to independent ball and – you pull up, you know, you put up these great numbers. You still got to look at who you're facing. Mm-hmm. But then again, we'll go back and, okay, what was this college career like? You know, we still use that history. History is huge for us, I know, in our organization, depending on your performance over over time. Then where does, where does the foreign market kind of go for that? So the foreign leagues, is that is that a thing for you guys to that's, go? Or is that out of your Yeah, that's, that's probably out of my out of my pay scale. <laughs> we have an international department. So just as the way we have scouts over here domestically, we have an international department that only sees international players in Latin America, Pacific Rim, things like that. So we don't get I don't get too much into the international side of it. I've taken trips over there mm-hmm. just for the purpose of having a gauge of the players over there compared to ours. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm not in the decision making process when it comes to those guys. What would you say, like the style of play? Like how how is it different amongst the different, like Americans mm-hmm. versus the Dominicans, Puerto Ricans, Koreans? I know Australia is starting to get pretty big. Uh, yeah. how, how does it? How how does that player? How do those players differ from one another? Uh, well, we hope there's not much difference. We're still looking for guys that can, you know, throw strikes, hit strikes pick the ball up, you know, and throw it across a diamond. Um, <clears throat> I think the, the the Latin American guys, I mean, they, they play a lot more just because of the weather, because of their passion for the game. Um, they play a lot more. So their skill level, and I won't say so much their skill level, but their athleticism, their instincts, they may be a little bit of ahead because they've been playing for so long. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, we took a trip. This was right before COVID, uh, in February before COVID hit. Um Myself, a scouting director, and our other cross checkers, we took a trip over to Dominican for like three or four days. And we drive up to this dorm area, and you got kids that are 12, 13, 14 years old come out of the dorm to work out for us. And these kids are pretty good, pretty pretty skilled players because that's that's all they know. Now, this, is, this may be at 11 o'clock in the morning, so they're not in school. School is not going to be the thing that helps them get off the island so to speak mm-hmm. those guys want to play baseball and that's all they do so where would you rank that skill level compared to like you know, like the youth level here or high, would you say they're like high school players at that point 12 to 13 year olds uh close to it close to it. other than the fact that they still haven't have as much strength as some of the yeah because they haven't hit that kids at that here maturity uh, nutrition is a little bit different so you're dealing with a guy that still has some ways to go strength wise you know, gaining weight, you know, things like that. But I think the passion for what they do is probably a little bit different than the guys over. Because, again, so many different things that kids over here can do. I mean, it's, those, those kids, again, those kids are playing baseball from January to December. Our kids here, if you're involved in other sports, you're involved in video games, you're involved in 
school work because you want to go to college. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a little bit, yeah, it's a little bit different. The kids over here, got you have to be really, really special to play at that next level because of the limited amount of time that you have to develop. Now, can you tell when you see a guy if he was a multi-sport athlete or he was just literally just baseball? I can't tell mm-hmm. just by looking at him. I mean, I know when I see an athlete on a baseball field, Yeah. Um, you would hope that some kids do play multiple sports, especially when they're young. It's hard to now because everything's so specialized. I mean, you get a lot of guys that right now they're in high school that could be really good basketball players, but they can't do that and get their tra- training and go through all the winter stuff that they do for baseball, specific stuff they do for baseball. Uh, but if you can get a guy that's a multi-sport guy and he has some athleticism, um, that's huge. It's huge. Um, what's, what's your recommendation for an athlete that has aspirations to play professional baseball? So, like, it, if I was 14 years old or 13 years old and was like, I want to play, I want to play professional baseball, what, what is the first thing that they need to start tackling? Well, <laughs> well first of all, you got to hope there's some God-given help there somewhere. You got, you got some uh, luck on your hands. Yeah, you got to have some luck on your hand. You got to – you know, you got to be somewhat built for it. Um, but you do have the guy that's going to be that grinder type of guy that's going to work, 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 work. And eventually somebody's going to see it and they're going to give this kid a chance. Um, because I know, I know a lot of dads are probably thinking right now, like, well, what about Jose Altuve? They're like, name all of these guys that are obscurities or outliers. Right. But the percentages aren't really conducive to those guys making it. Right. So, like, how do you – how do you tell tell that to a player? Like, oh, I'm five foot eight, and like I said, it's it's you got to be a grinder. It's got to be makeup. Altuve, you know, he went to a workout that he was not invited to, and was sent home after the first day. <laughs> came back the next day. Came back the next day. He continued to come back, continued to show up. Obviously, incredible bat to ball skills. So it was like a Rudy story. He just kept on showing just up. Just kept showing up. Just kept showing up. And next thing you know, you couldn't deny the fact that he put the ball in play. He played hard. He great passion for the game. You got certain outliers for that. There's not a lot of Altuve's out there playing baseball. So I think, you know, if a kid's starting off, that's what he wants to do, you got to put the work. You got to have the work ethic. You have to have the makeup. You got to have the patience. Um, you got to be somewhat realistic. Because, um, again, it gets to a point where we want to blame somebody else for our lack of success or – Whatever in baseball, it's I mean you're in the box by yourself, you're on the mound by yourself. You gotta you gotta produce. So it's yeah, it's work ethic, it's makeup, it's that that never changes. Those yeah. guys in big leagues have incredible makeup and incredible work ethic. It's almost like you can't expect a scout to say, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna draft you when you're below the average height and you don't look the part right. to what a major leaguer is. Like I. When guys say, "Oh, I want to play professional baseball," I tell them, hey, "Look at look at the different dem- demographics on the game and what the rosters have. Like, what's the average height of a major leaguer? Where are you? So, there's gonna be there's gonna be some. You're gonna have to either knock on the door and keep knocking, right. or right. do something else. Right. Because again, the percentages are really bad. <laughs> like, it's like almost winning the lottery to make it to major league baseball. So, no one. I mean. I mean, these guys have been around college baseball. You had a career you had in Missouri. You, you, you can tell. You see players that physically may have the ability, but it may be something else that just stops them from getting to the next level. Again, whether it's work ethic or makeup. You certainly got to want it. Right. Certainly got to want it. You can overcome a lot of things I if remember, you want it. I remember when I was in high school, and this is, this is back in 94 years ago. I'm aging myself here, and I know things have changed. <laughs> but I remember – my mindset when I was in high school is I wanted to play pro ball and I wanted to get a college degree. And getting a college degree didn't mean play college baseball to me. Like I, I, thought, I thought playing college baseball was my next step to play pro ball. And I just always thought, I'm going to play pro ball. I'm going to be in the big leagues. They were made to the big leagues, but I got a chance and got, got drafted. And nobody wanted me out of high school. I had two chances, Missouri Baptist and a junior college in over in Illinois, and that was it. And then Mizzou called after my senior year in the summer, about two, three weeks before reporting mm-hmm. date. So I switched from JUCO to there. But my whole mindset was I'm going to get a college degree, but I want to play pro ball. How am I going to do that? Right. Well, I'll just go to any college that wants me, and I'll play and prove myself. 
Like that was my mindset back then. I don't know if you had a story like that, Evan, when you played or what your mind, because you played pro ball, right? And um, kind of what you went through. And I just, I always forget what kids are thinking now because we deal with high school kids all the time, right? That's what we do every day. Right. You know, it's not the actual college players much. Um, I just always wonder what, what they're thinking because our, our focus with our program is college. How do we get kids into college? Mm-hmm. How do we help them? What resources? How do we develop them? But, you know, I, I, their, their dreams, I'm sure, are playing pro ball beyond that for, for a lot of them. So, I, you know, and I, I think know. that's where I think that's where it starts. I think most kids, their target should be to go play in college. Yeah. Uh, to select few guys that get drafted out of high school. The majority of guys go to college. They get bigger. They get stronger. They learn how to play the game. They learn how to be away from family. And that's where, again, most teams mm-hmm. are, are fishing in terms of, in terms of the prospects. And plus, with a high school guy, we can't. The way analytics is nowadays, we we ha- we use those. With a high school kid, we can't we can't find analytical data on a high school kid. There's not a lot of track mans in high school fields. Exactly, yeah. and there's not a history of that guy playing high school. I mean, you know, against really good competition over a two or three year period. Yeah. So with the college guy, again, he has a leg up because we have more history. We see him play against better competition. Um, they're more minor league ready, where I think the high school kid, again, unless you're a, you know, a bonus baby, you're going to get millions, you can't walk away from that. But if your guy is kind of on the on the edge, I think you should continue to try to shoot to go play college baseball somewhere. Mm-hmm. Well, don't you kind of use, you guys especially, use college baseball as like your minor leagues? You want them to develop, and you want them to – one thing that I was told when I was starting to play, and you want to spend as less time in the minor leagues as possible. Right. You want to get to the big leagues. That's where you right. want to play. Right. You're not making money in the minor leagues. I was, yeah. it was, I was making 880 bucks, and I think it's gone up like 10 bucks since right. 1991. Right. Exactly. You know, and that's, that's a different story for another podcast. But, but that's, that's <clears> kind of, I think, by design. They're wanting to kind of not necessarily starve you out. But, hey, are you going to do this thing or not? Do you want to get to the big leagues or not? Otherwise, like you said, this mm-hmm. next guy is coming up. It's a grind. It's a grind. It's and you better be ready to go. You better be, 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 be ready to put your best foot yeah. forward right. or they're going to send you home. And I, I've gotten the chance to do that, and, and, and both of us get yeah. sent home. <laughs> yeah. Hey, here, go, go, go start life. Right. It was great. It was fun. You know, we've got baseball cards, and we can say we played pro ball. But we didn't make it, which was yeah. you know one thing we always wanted to do. But – you know that you kind of like use that college end of it to, mm-hmm. to get college, you know, pro ready dudes. That's kind of what you do, kind of what you target, I think. And I don't think it's been actually put out there, but I think once they went back to, or not so much back, but went to twenty rounds, that helped the college programs because some of these high school kids that we were kind of throwing money at and wanted to give them a shot, we're not doing it anymore. We got the slot <laughs> system, we have less rounds. Those. Probably a little bit better than average high school players are going to college now instead of going and trying to find their way through minor league baseball. They're going to college, which is making the college programs better, which in turn helps make us better because, again, like you said, that's kind of our you know, approving ground for us. Kind of how I view it from the outside perspective is that when you guys had all those minor league teams, like, oh, we can develop these guys, and then it felt like you guys realized, oh, we have a lot of co- – overhead cost here why are we right. why are we trying right. to do it ourselves right. Right. we got really good college coaches so right. let's just have the college coaches right. do it <laughs> and, and then, it was kind of a disservice to the players sometimes too because you draft that player and they're not getting they're not getting enough at bats they're mm-hmm. not getting enough reps and next thing you know you're looking two years down the road and this guy hadn't gotten any better well probably hadn't gotten any better because he hadn't played a whole lot even though he's in the minor league system he still hasn't played a whole lot you can almost take that down to the four-year schools is like, why would you want to go to a four-year school if you're going to sit the whole time? That doesn't make any sense. So why why don't you go to junior college instead and get right. get developed? <laughs> so that's, it's almost that's the same concept. That's what's starting to happen now with the, with the transfer portal. I mean, these college guys are recruiting the portal now. So if you're a high school guy, let's say you can want to go to, you know, LSU, but all of a sudden, sometime during the summer, LSU body and three portal guys that are juniors from Ole Miss. That stunts your growth as a high school guy. You're probably not going to play. So your best route may be to go to a D2, D3 junior college and get a chance to play. You know what the transfer portal did? I would like your take on this. It's almost like the transfer portal made every level like junior college. I can pick up anybody. Yeah, for the most part. For the most part. Because that D2 guy, that D3 guy, that NAIA guy who has incredible amount of performance at that level, 
those those college D one guys are going after that guy. They're finding a way to get that guy in a portal, and they'll go get that guy because he's proven himself against college players. Albeit D two D three, they still proven themselves to be able to compete against guys close to the same level. So if you're a coach, you're going to take that guy over some high school guy that you got to freaking develop for two years. I know it's a hired gun, basically. Basically, so right. that's kind of that's what it's. What it's, it's a mercenary. For, I get to hire my mercenary. <laughs> Uh, college baseball. So um, I, got, I got a question for you, Mark. Different subject. Talked on earlier. You said you go to games kind of with target of mind to watch certain players. So I was actually at a game last year and ran into you. We watched about five or six innings together. But the Division Illinois game. Yeah, but yeah. Division One game. And, and I, I believe you said you're there to watch three guys. So if, if that's a case like that or, or any game you go to, how often do you find other guys when you're watching – the ones you're going to see. And the, well, at the college level, we we pretty much know the college roster for the most part. I mean, I yeah. know if Missouri, I, I know their roster. I know which guys can play. I know which yeah. guys. Nobody's going to surprise me on those programs. Um, so when again, when I go, I know which guys are. I already know which guys are prospects. So those guys, the ones I'm bearing down on, and it's and it's difficult to sit there and watch everybody play. Yeah, you know, I'm, I may want to get a certain view on a hitter. Um, one or two hitters as opposed to trying to see, you know, all guys in the lineup. Um, so very seldom with a guy like that just all of a sudden pop up in the spring and he's a dude. So, that's, again, let's take Missouri for instance. I saw them play probably three or four times during the fall, so I pretty much know yeah. who the guys. It's not going to be any surprises. Okay. So. The, I always would love to have just the eyes of a scout and being like, yep, that's a guy. Yep, that's a guy. I yeah, feel like that. We, we, I, I, 26 years later, man, we're still trying to figure out. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a tough one. Because it's, it's a different player. It's a different, you know, it's a different situation like every year. So it's like kind of like once the draft happens, you got to turn that year off and focus on these next guys coming up. So, And we, we have more mistakes than we have successes in terms of, in terms of scouting. If you get lucky and you draft a guy as an area scout, you sign a guy that makes the big leagues, that's like a big deal. Well, I mean, there's only four, you only get 40, 40 man roster, so get to get actually on the roster itself, right. right? Right. I mean, those numbers aren't really. That's tough. So yeah, you and take how, how many players are in minor league baseball? Um, I think it's going back to like probably five teams now. Five teams. Five or six teams. Deep. So on your complex, you probably have a little bit more thirty to thirty five on a roster, and then once you get into you know, full season. This is probably twenty five to twenty six. Um, so, yeah, for whatever that is, numbers wise. Um, and you're only and you're only working towards forty spots. That's crazy. Yeah, but you got to also take into account that you know some of those guys, those younger guys, they're still ways away. Yeah, uh, they not even consider anywhere close to to the forty man. So, how many touch points do you need to say, yeah, that's a prospect? Uh it, it depends on the position. Um, for me, um, again, it depends on the position. It depends on the level. I mean, the, the, the college guy, obviously, you want to, you know, you want there to be some strength. You want there to be some some type of aggressiveness. You want there to be some instincts to play. Um, with the high school guys, some of that stuff is still still there. But again, you want to be able to see some level of projection, um, athleticism. Um, so it's not like you go to a ballpark and then you see the guy's actions and you're like, yeah, that's a dude. No, there's so many other things involved in I, mean, I can see him and say, okay, that's a dude, but depending on what position you play, play is, can he run, you know, can he hit? You know, some guys, if they're going to play on a the corner, they better swing that bat really, really well in order to be like a dude. Guy in the middle, you still got to be able to swing it, but you got to be able to pick it up and throw it pretty easily too. So it kind of just depends on, on the position. Uh, to be able to tell, like, that's the guy. And, again, like I said, we've missed on a lot of guys that we thought were dudes, and they weren't, and vice versa. I've always heard that the all-around player, and I don't know if this is um, bad advice that I was given, but the all-around player is more likely not going to make it. The guy that has the one tool or the two tools is going to be the guy that gets picked. Um. It, I think it kind of depends on the scouts sometimes too. You got certain scouts that can read 
that all-around player and knows that he's going to find a way. Over time, he's going to find a way to be successful. Um, so it's not necessarily the tool that ends up. But you have a lot of tools you guys that have, like, zero shot. I mean, they, they, maybe they can run, maybe they can throw it, uh, but the instincts of the game just don't seem to fit into what you're really, really looking for. So for me personally, I, I like baseball players. I like guys that can play the game, that can do a lot of different things. I know the game. And when you show up after five days, they've got a number of hits, they've stolen bases, they've made great plays, where the case might be. And that's why we see these guys so many times. It's not just a one look. We see these guys as many times as we can, especially the guys that are real prospects. You'll see it time and time and time again because you're going to see something different and hopefully something else triggers to make you think, okay, I really like the guy now. And you see him again like that's the guy. So the guy that throws like 94 and 95, it's not a in the bag like that guy's going to be a high draft pick. He's got to show some type of secondary pitch. Secondary pitch. He's got to be able to locate his fastball, what type of movement, strikes. what type right. of movement does he have. Right. And then you basically rate it on that scale. And, 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 you know, again, some athleticism. I mean, I don't think people realize how – what good athletes some of these pitchers are in the big leagues. Because, again, you're talking about a guy that has to make adjustments over time. Guys that aren't athletes, it's hard for those guys to make adjustments because their bodies just don't allow them to do things different than what they're, what they're used to. Um, so, so all the crap that POs get, it's not – True. They have to be athletes. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> they have they have to be athletes again, unless they're blessed with enormous arm strength or ability it, to spit it. Is it easier for you to scout and I guess or to project out like a pitcher or a positional player for you personally? Um, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of weird because I was a I'll say I was a hitter. I I was in the lineup as a hitter. I'll say that. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I feel I was. <laughs> for me, it, it, I felt like it was easier for me to, to scout pitching because I knew what got me out. I knew what I didn't like. I knew I could tell what was – that's going to get most guys out. Um, so, for me, pitching was a little bit easier for me to gauge. Uh, hitting was a little bit tougher for me. And it's, it's almost kind of weird because you figure most hitters can scout hitting. Uh, for me, it, it, it took a while just because I started realizing all the things I did wrong as a hitter. Um, so I had to kind of look for other different things and different. Like you know, na- name one thing that you thought like when you, it was like a revelation. You're like, oh man, I did th- I did this wrong because I think that's a really cool perspective. Is you you now in the scout and you're evaluating hitters as, and, a, as a hitter? Yeah, like what. Like what, what? Like you? Because I think that's a really cool thing. Because like I, I wish I could go back and be like, "Do you need uh, a pen and paper? This is going to be a long list." Because <laughs> uh, like when yeah, I, all, all of us, yeah. Because no, no. like, because like pro- professional prof- ranking a player from a professional standpoint is totally different from a college pr- standpoint. Like I can look at a guy now and be like, "Yeah, you're going to play college." Like I, he has some tools and he's probably going to make it because. Right. The probabilities are a lot higher for him to make sure, it, sure. but for a professional, it's the it, you have to be so razor thin on your decision of like, yeah, that guy's not going to hit in the big leagues. That guy's not going to hit in minor league baseball. He's not going to make it past double A. Yeah, I don't. I don't think for me personally. Um, again, where I played in high school, I wouldn't say baseball is like my main sport. Mm-hmm. I mean, I had some opportunities to go play football, and I dabbled in basketball. And I played baseball because I was athletic enough. I was I was good enough. I had some skill. And then when I got to Missouri, I felt like I was a little bit behind. A lot of guys, even from guys from like from St. Louis, because the competition level wasn't overly great. I didn't spend a lot of time on it during the off season. I mean, you got guys now that'll come up here and hit during winter break the whole time they're at home. I can't remember ever doing that when I was in high school. And then, like I say, once I got to Missouri, it was so much going on, and the pitching got so much better. I never found a way to, never found a way to make the adjustment. Mm. So before you know it, I'm in my third year. I'm hitting 220 or whatever, and it's like, kind of your shots kind of going by. But I played every day for the most part because I was really good defensively. Mm-hmm. Um, I would, I, I felt like I had good work ethic. I felt like I had good makeup. Um, but the hitting part just never, never clicked for me. And I'm not sure. So it's just a realization why. that, like, maybe it was like, maybe I should hit in the winter. I probably should have should have hit more. Yeah. I mean, even even when I was at Missouri, I didn't I didn't use the time given to me to improve my hitting. I didn't go I didn't go hit in the cage. And that's crazy. We like, spent a lot of time with as much as guys spend on it now. Hack would say that too. He was like, "Yeah, I didn't hit that much in the winter." No, 
It's like, oh man, I wish I was like that. <laughs> like I had to, I had to hit every single day, and I barely made the lineup. <laughs> so, so yeah, knowing what I know now, I wish I would have done things differently. Yeah. Um, but that's yeah. I think I, that's what I see now. I like hitters that take the time and go hit, go hit and hit, and improve your craft and hit off a tee and do soft. I didn't, I didn't do that stuff. Therefore, I wasn't a very good hitter. So it's I, amazing how much you become a self coach when you do that. Hundred percent, and you feel, oh, that's what that guy's been telling me for five years. Yeah, and it just clicks all of a sudden. Ah, and then it becomes part of your resume or part of your DNA as far as what you do as a hitter or as a player. And when you do it, it's not like you got to hit twenty four seven, but you do have to put, like we talked about, you have to put the work in to get mm-hmm. to that pro level or college level or even high school level. And if you don't, if you're just a time clocker, you're never going to make it. It's almost like an evolution. Like you can tell, I, I, I love seeing pro guys when they come in here and hit. Their process is totally different than mm-hmm. a high school guy who's just he needs he needs his dad or needs a coach to help him along the way. Right. And then the college guy can come in on his own, but then he also needs a buddy to come with him. But then the pro guy is like he's in and out of the facility like that, mm-hmm. and spend, it seems like he spends more time in the weight room. And then taking care of his body, then actually the skill side of things. Just kind of cool, like seeing the evolution of how well, that. I how think that when works. they get to that point, they're fine tuning things, right. and they put the work in to get to that point, and they understand and know their body, their swing, and their what they do. Twenty thirty minutes, I'm good. Yeah. I got the, I got the feel of it. I think they come out with their routine that day too, and a plan. Right. Like I'm gonna take these swings this way. Like pool, she's come and hit for six, seven years at balls and strikes. And we sit there and watch him in the office and stuff. And first round was teased. He did about 30 or 40 balls right in the corner in the same spot, line drive oppo. But every day he did that, and he then he went into front toss and went into some BP. But he had his routine, and he was out at a certain time. Yeah, but he didn't spend Matt the whole Adams day there. Does it when, here right now when he comes yeah. in. You know, he's yeah. not here that long, but he's going through the same drill sets where I think if it's a high school kid coming in with their friends, like it's great to see him. You want those gym rats. But they're just in there hitting and hacking away, and but I think it's part of them figuring it out, and they'll get there. Figuring out the they'll process, routine, yeah. You know, but again, so, you only know what you know, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, I have mm-hmm. one more, and sure. we don't need to keep it long, but just one more topic I'm interested yeah. in: draft week. Does that just get crazy out of hand, like with with the Oakland A's and your organization, how that works, and mm-hmm. kids off the board or back on the board? And can you can you give us a couple minute insight on that? Yeah, for us, it's. Um, and again, I think most organizations are the same. It's it's a ten day process for us. We show up in Oakland, and we know we're going to be there for ten days until the end of the draft. Um, because of computer systems and resources and things like that, by the time we get to Oakland, we pretty much got an idea of what our board's going to look like. Because mm-hmm. as we turn in reports, they're populated into a certain order based on the grades we put and things like that. So we don't spend a whole lot of time talking about you know, a real true order. But like I said, the first couple of days, it's um, the cross checkers, front office, meaning scouting director, GM, and we'll put our top 70 names on the board and we'll just hash out those top 70 names. We think those top 70 names are going to get us at least through the third round. So we'll kind of hash those out and kind of move guys up and down depending on how we like them, the consensus of the room. Because most of those guys have been seen by at least five guys in that room. Okay. Um, after that, the area guys will come in, like on the fourth day. They'll provide a little bit more insight on the player, and it will start, we'll start sifting through the rest of the draft as well. We'll lead those top 70 guys out, and we'll sift through um, the next few rounds. But the area scout will provide us more information, background information, makeup information on those players. Um, <clears throat> we'll spend a day where it's a medical day, our doctors will come in. They'll go over medical information on a certain player. We'll tell you, what do you think about so-and-so? And he'll read through his medical. Yeah, this guy has X, Y, and Z. It's probably guys you stay away from. Or, this guy has a reoccurring whatever. Stay away from it. Or, hey, this guy's yeah. produced, you know, over the last few years, so the injury is not as big a deal. So we'll spend a whole day just going through medical information. Okay. Um, by the time we get the draft day itself, all the work has been, has been done. Because you, you just gotta wait and see who you know who the other team's taking, who's left and who's not. Um, as far as guys on the board and being taken off, with a medical will be a reason guys taken off. 
you get some guy whose value is their value for themselves is a lot higher than what we think it is. So we we will eliminate that guy because of you know monetary mm-hmm. reasons. Um, and then yes, yeah, an exciting day because we spent you know seven eight months getting ready for it. But yeah. again, most of the work is done. It's pretty much just kind of just sit back and sit right back and forward. watch. Right. How many how many players are on your board? Probably to start, probably twelve to thirteen hundred. I guess. I mean, you're talking the entire country. You're talking multiple you know, age Puerto groups. Puerto Rico. You're talking yeah. Canada. Um, but again, those a lot of those guys get weeded out pretty quickly. Again, because of medical, because of financial reasons. Um, then yeah. with 20, 20 rounds, right? So yeah, you end yeah. up with that many players. Right. Yeah. Right. So yeah, you start with that many, you end up with with twenty. <laughs> Here's a question we didn't hit on um, during the like scouting side of things, like actually seeing the player on the field. Mm-hmm. If someone throws their bat or just throws it in disgust or argues a call or anything like that, is that a major cross off for you, or is that kind of just part of the game? And you're like, you have to evaluate it. <laughs> Depends on how good the si- player is. <laughs> situation. <laughs> um, I mean, that's it. you take that in consideration. Um, but I, I think for the most part, the kids that we're looking at, the ones that know their prospects, don't do things like that. Very seldom you get a guy that's a, a really good prospect to where he's going to carry himself that way. He's been taught. He, he knows the routine. He's not going to – because he knows guys that they're watching. He's not going to do anything like that. Mm-hmm. Um, if you get guys that do end up doing things like that, it's, it's – you take notice. It's, it can be a red flag. Um, but for the most part, your better players don't respond like that. So we don't really have to have to delve into it. Self-control. Right. I guess you want to see some fire, though, right? Like yeah, if those guys are, yeah, or, yeah, yeah. It depends on the player, yeah. depends on the situation. Yeah. Um, Was well, it like if it's like zero for four with like four Ks and just had a really crappy day? Like we've all been there, and you just want to scream into your helmet. <laughs> right. And again, if we're if we're there to see that guy and he strikes out four times, and because we're there to see him already, we know it's just probably it's bad probably day. A bad day. Yeah. I mean, I think his first. Minor league game, Chris Bryant struck out like five times. Ouch. It was his first minor league game when I was with the Cubs. And we were like. Jason Bell told me, he's a, one of my friends from the Houston Astros, he said Pena, the current shortstop for the Astros, yeah. he, he, was, he was managing the single A team and he had Pena as his first year and he had no idea who this kid was. He just like, the Astros like, picked him up and right. like here's here's your new shortstop and jason had one word conversation with him before he hit the field pena made six errors that night and he was like what do i tell the guy I, you're not gonna make it to the big leagues like yeah. what do you say <laughs> six errors in one game and just like yep that's the start of our season we'll see how this plays out and, that, and that's that's part of the process you got to have guys that can can handle those types of situations and can make adjustments and you know you know, walk out the locker room that day thinking tomorrow's a new day, you know, so. Which is so hard to do in the short term because <laughs> you think the world's crashing down on yeah. you. <laughs> so, Mark, thanks again for um, doing this it. episode. Um, a little selfishly for me, it's been an eye-opener for from the scouting perspective, so I appreciate that. Um, Aaron, Evan, thanks for joining in on this and kicking Dave out. Absolutely. I've been, getting, I've been getting so tired of my co-host. Absolutely. <laughs> Step it up. No, I and I mean to, to the last thing is that what you guys do here is I think it's awesome. Um, for Appreciate me to be that. lucky enough to come up here and work with some guys, but be around some guys that I've I've known over the years. It's yeah, it's comfortable and it's good for for me to be able to do it. That's awesome. So we appreciate that. Appreciate it. Guys, that's this episode of The Closing Pitch. Please make sure that you subscribe to the channel. Give us a five-star review. Dave will be back in the saddle for um, the next episode. We will catch you later. See you.